uh, we're going to continue our series in 1 Timothy, The Good Fight. In fact, we're coming down to the close of this series. We've been in it all summer, and it ends actually next Sunday with the final uh, where we actually finally arrived to the verse where it says, fight the good fight, Timothy. You got to fight the good fight for the faith. That's in next week's message. We're in the first part of it this week, uh, and I'm excited to share that about uh, what it means to have godliness with contentment. Godliness with contentment. In fact, there is a verse uh, in uh, 1 Timothy 6 and verse 6. This is a short verse. I think it is memorizable, if that is the right word. I think you guys could probably have this memorized by the time we walk out of here today. So I want to practice it with you one time as we launch this message today. Can you please repeat after me? But godliness with contentment is great gain, right? Godliness with contentment is great gain. There's a lot of truth to that verse. Let's get ready to dive in, and I invite you to join me with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, there's a secret to this verse that is eluding most of us American Christians uh, who are struggling with discontentment of having whatever we have, but we're not happy with it. And Lord, I pray that you'll show us the secret of contentment and the idea to combine that contentment with godliness, because you promise that if we do both, that we're going to have great gain. So, Lord, open up our minds and our eyes, our ears, our, our wills to understand the truth of that and help us to do what you're calling us to do. And help me as a speaker, Lord, help my words to be clear and powerful and passionate. Lord, uh, give me the, this, the right words to say in the right order. Lord, may you get all the glory for it and may your kingdom advance in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. But godliness with contentment is great gain. You know, most people in America, at least, when you ask them the question, you say, okay, what do you think the goal in life is? What is your goal in life? What are most people's goal in life? And most people, if they're honest, you know, before they try to come up with a lot of specifics, most people say, well, most people just what want to be happy right? Most people just want to be happy. And then, of course, the devil is in the details because then you ask the follow-up question, what does that mean for somebody to be happy? And then they start giving you a list of, well, if I just had this or if we had that or this was in, taking place in my life, then I could be happy, right? So happiness always seems to be elusive. Happiness comes from that, uh, there's a word called hap, which where we get word, the word what's happening or happenstance. But basically, it just means whatever your present circumstance is. If you're happy, it means your present circumstance is good. If you're not happy, it means your present circumstance is not what you want it to be and you want to change it. So happiness has more to do with your circumstances than what's going on in the inside of your life. So uh, they've done studies on this. In fact, I was reading one yesterday, a study on happiness. And here's the good news, because most people, if you uh, ask them, you know, be honest with me, don't try to give me the right answer. Just give me what your answer really would be. If you thought you had this, you'd be happy. Uh, mo what, what they found in the studies is when they ask people, what does it mean to be happy? The answer is not found in money. It's not found in material possessions. And by the way, this isn't just one study. This is like many studies. This is, a, this is almost a universal truth. When it comes down to it, money doesn't ultimately make people happy. Now, you may say, well, I want to test that hypothesis. So uh, well, why don't you give me a lot of money and then let's see if I can make it work or not? Because I think I'd be the exception to the rule. But it, it, multiple studies have proven this out. Money does not make ultimately people happy, nor do material possessions. Intelligence alone doesn't make people happy. Uh, being the right age, being older or younger doesn't make people happy. Being the right gender. I don't know if that was a recent study. People don't want to be the gender that they are. But that doesn't alone, whether you're male or female, that doesn't necessarily make you happy. When people... Come, when it comes down to it, people say, what really makes you happy in life? The, these are the top five answers. Number one is family, family and relationships. 
And, and of course, I think what's implied in that is family when family is doing family the way we're supposed to, right? When they're, we're loving one another, we're getting along, we're supportive of each other, we're forgiving each other when we mess up, that kind of a thing. So family and relationships are the number one reason why people are happy. The other uh, reasons are meaningful work. In other words, people find something meaningful to do where they really feel like they're making a difference in this world or they're using the gifts and talents that God has given them uh, to make a difference in the world that they're in. Uh, forgiveness is mentioned as a key to happiness because if you really go back to family and relationships, if you're not either practicing forgiving someone who's hurting you or receiving forg forgiveness when you've hurt somebody else, if forgiveness isn't happening, you're not going to have good family or relationships because you're going to hurt somebody eventually. So forgiveness is key. Positive thinking is key. This idea that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wake up this morning and I'm going to have a good day or today is going to be better. If I had a bad day yesterday, today is going to be better because God is with me, because I, I have hope that circumstances are going to change, that God is not going to leave me right where I am, that he is my helper and he is my strength and my shield. So positive thinking. And, and then finally, one key to happiness that they've discovered across the board is just this simple idea of gratitude. Gratitude, of being thankful for what you have, whatever it is you have. If you say, well, thank God that at least I got up this morning and I could put my pants on one leg at a time. I mean, if, if that's all you had today, I mean, you could be thankful for that. So being, uh, being grateful for what you do have in your life is related to happiness. Happiness is related to contentment. Now, what I want to talk about today is freedom from discontentment. Because what's happening in a lot of people's lives is they have what they have, whatever their circumstance is, and they're looking around and they're seeing what somebody else has or what other people have or something like that. And either by comparison or by watching uh, television and media and getting advertisements, which, by the way, the whole goal of advertisement is to make you unhappy right where you are. And, but the only way you can get happy is if you have this product. You know, life's terrible right now, but if you had our gizmo, boy, you know, you'd be sailing and life would be grand. Right? So that's the whole goal of advertising. So those things tend to make us unhappy or discontent when we start looking around and not be grateful for what we already have. Right? So before I get into this idea of how to have freedom from discontentment, we've got to get this first part out of the way because the first five verses of chapter 6 have to do with Paul circling back with Timothy and say, Timothy, if you're going to be a good minister of the gospel, if you're going to be a good leader in this church, you have to take care of this in the church. False teachings going on, Timothy, you need to do something about it. So we arrive uh, with slide number three, and there's a, a long verse here, and, and Paul tells Timothy this, teach these things, Timothy, and encourage everyone to obey them. Some people may contradict our teaching, but these are the wholesome teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ. These teachings promote a godly life. So whatever a wholesome teaching is about Jesus, it promotes a godly life, a life that one wants to honor God. Anyone who teaches something different is arrogant and lacks understanding. And by the way, arrogant and lacks understanding. I looked up a bunch of different translations. There's a great one. It's called the Revised English uh, version from Oxford University. And it says, anybody who teaches something different is a pompous ignoramus. A pompous ignoramus. True translation. The R-E-B. Look it up. <laughs> so I like it. So you don't want to be a pompous ignoramus. You want to have the right teaching and the right attitude, not teaching something different. So Paul's circling back. He's reminding Timothy, you can't have a good church unless you take care of the false teaching that's going on, Timothy. So he's reminding teaching that uh, what the false teachers are doing that's contrary to the wholesome teachings. And the first thing he says is false teaching, number one, next slide please, false teaching does not promote a godly life. 
right? If you hear false teaching, it is not going to lead you to a more Christ-honoring life. False teaching is going to lead you away from a Christ-honoring life, away from greater reference for God. You're going to be, end up being more worldly and less God-centered and godly-minded, right? So there's number one with false teaching. And then number two, the false teachers were arrogant and lacked understanding. One thing you can always tell in a godly person is they have this element of humility, right? And the element of humility is not thinking terribly of yourself. I, the one translation I remember in Romans 12 was it says, don't think of yourselves more highly than you ought to. Have a sober estimate of your own capab capabilities. Have a sober estimate of your capabilities. So true humility isn't the idea that, hey, you know, I can preach like Stephen Furtick, that would, that would not be humility, nor would it be true. If you don't know who Stephen Furtick is, it doesn't matter. Elevation Church, one of the biggest churches in America. But anyway, so, and he's really talented and gifted. So one thing would be humility uh, is thinking of yourself more highly than you ought, but also there's this false humility of thinking yourself worse than you ought. I'm a worm, I'm nothing, I got nothing. God hasn't gifted me with anything. You know, i just walking around down all the time, can't do anything, won't do anything because you think God has just left you on the sideline, right? Real humility is somewhere in the middle, is saying, God, these are the gifts and talents that you've given me and you want me to use them for your glory. And if I'm gonna use what I have for your glory, you say somehow that you'll multiply them and you'll make me even better at what I'm doing for your kingdom and for your glory than what I am now if I take what you've given me and use them for your glory. Real humility is saying whatever I have is a gift from God, right? I don't just have it on my own. I didn't get here by myself. God has trained me. He's worked in me. He's, he's invested in me. He's gifted me in certain ways. And he says, now use it. Use it for my glory. So don't be arrogant and understanding. Don't be a pompous ignoramus. You know, don't be one of those false teachers. And then we get to the next verse. And it says, such a person, talking about these false teachers, such a person has an unhealthy desire to quibble over the meaning of words. And you may, you may think there's somebody in the church like this. Maybe you've been in a church where there's somebody. Somebody who likes, loves to argue, loves to quibble over the meaning of words. They love to stir up arguments. And, they, and the arguments don't ever actually reach a good conclusion. Hey, we found the right answer by talking about this issue. It just ends up in jealousy, division, slander, which is like talking bad about somebody, um, and evil suspicions. When you meet, when you meet somebody like that, it's more likely they're going to be a false teacher than a real teacher. And these people always cause trouble. Their minds are corrupt. They've turned their backs on the truth. So when you see somebody that's always stirring up trouble, always creating division, always creating dissatisfaction, always complaining or whining or something's wrong, you know, 99 things went right, and they want to focus on the one thing that went wrong, and that's all they can talk about. And you're just like, ah, oh, this person is like a, drain, a VDP. You ever met a VDP? A very draining person, right? And you don't want to be one of those people. And you look around and you say, man, if every church has one of these, I don't know if I can identify one or not. And if you can't identify one, look in the mirror because <laughs> chances are you may be the very draining person. But it's like you don't, it, when you go to church, we go to, we gather together as God's people to build one another up, to encourage each other, not discourage each other, to spur one another on. And that doesn't mean like put the spurs to each other, like, like on a horse with the spurs. I mean, the idea was to, to motivate each other toward love and good works, to do something better. You can do better. We can all do better. That, that kind of attitude and a can-do spirit not a can't-do spirit. So, just, so before we talk about discontentment and make that the focus, Paul's saying, Timothy, one more time, don't let these false teachers infiltrate your church. Don't let them corrupt your church. You focus on, back to chapter 4, remember when Timothy teach and teach these things, back to chapter 4 when he says, Timothy, you focus on the public reading of Scripture, you focus on preaching, and you focus on teaching. Fill God's people up so much with truth and the idea that with God's help, we can live out this truth and we can make a difference in our world. 
And in Lisa's uh, illustration about the college football kicking off this weekend, um, if, and the, by the way, it's American football, so to all our international friends, we're not talking about that other football. Uh, American football. And the idea is church, and this is my analogy, and I mentioned it before, but church is, church, in, in, in a football analogy, gathering like we're doing right now, this is the huddle. This is the huddle. This is when we say, okay, okay, team, this is the play we're going to run this week. And, this, and, and it's love one another. It's love God with all your heart. It's love your neighbor as yourself. It's make a difference. It's meet people with tattoos and piercings. And don't look on the outside, but see, see who God made them on the inside and try to attract them to the gospel, the good news of Jesus. And if you can, invite them and bring them back to church next week. So the next time we huddle together, we'll have even more good news to share with each other. The idea to huddle now so we can go out and run the play during the week. And by the way, what's the more important thing? Uh, you ever seen NFL Network? You say, no, but I'm getting ready to for about the next 17 weeks. All right, so, so next weekend when, when uh, the NFL, National Football League, kicks off, there's this channel, it's a 154 a dish, but I, it, I don't even know why I know that because it doesn't matter to me. Uh, but, uh, but the NFL... Uh, is going to kick off, and sometimes they do these recaps of games. And what they do is, they, and, and what's really astounding is when they do a recap of a game and all they do is show you the plays, they don't show you the after the tackle, they don't show you the coach's reaction, they don't show you the team gathering up and huddling up, they don't show you the commentators telling you all about why this play worked or didn't work. They just go from this play and then they go to the next play and the next play and the next play. And you realize, wow, a real football game is only about 34 minutes. <laughs> but it lasts three hours on TV. So, so you realize that, but so much of what we watch is not the actual game itself. But what matters the most? When, when in the NFL does a recap of the game, do you think that all they're doing is, well, they're showing you the huddles, and they're showing you the commentators, and they're showing you the commercials. Would anybody tune in for that? I wouldn't. I'd say, I want to know the plays. You know, I, you know you're, you're, you're training all week. You're getting ready to beat this team. I want to see the plays you're going to run. We get together for church. It's the plays we run based upon the huddle to say, now that we know what the play is, we know what we're supposed to do, let's do this. And by the way, most of church, and I'll just speak for myself because I've been in the church a long time like a lot of you. Do you always go to church and learn something brand new? <gasps> I never knew that before, you know? Or do you go to church to get reminded? Oh, yeah, that forgiveness thing. <laughs> I'm supposed to do that, right? I'm supposed to, you know, forgive as the Lord has forgiven you, all right? So we, now that we know the right thing, so sometimes the huddle is just a reminder. You remember the play we're supposed to run? Love God with all your heart. Go love your neighbor as yourself. Go love one another as the Lord Jesus loves us. That's pretty simple. Now we're getting into the details. So enough of the false teachers. Let's go, let's go to how to be free from discontentment. How to be free from discontentment, right? So it says you, and this is in verse 6 here. Look at this. Yet, and this is the New Living Translation. Verse 6. Yet true godliness with contentment is itself great wealth. After all, we brought nothing into this with us into, when we came into the world, and we can take, and we, you know what happens? You, you know it in a certain version, and then you read it in another version, and you're thinking in your head the other version. So this is New Living Translation. It's actually a really good translation. That's why I put it up here. Yet true godliness with contentment is itself great wealth. After all, we brought nothing with us when we came into the world, and we can't take anything with us when we leave it. So if we have enough food and clothing, let us be content. Now, don't pass by verse 8 there. So if we have enough food and clothing, let us be content. Because I want to ask how many American Christians you know, on this planet right now can really say that and mean it? Oh, if, if I have food to eat and clothes on my back, I'm going to be content. You know, In the rest of the world, that might be true. In a lot of places in the world, places like Zimbabwe, right? If you have enough food to eat and you have clothing on your back and a place to sleep, you can be content with that. It's here in America where we have more than anybody else in the world, and yet we have more discontented people. And we got to get past that. 
we got to learn the secret of contentment. God, here we go again, verse 6. Are you ready to memorize this? Godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness with contentment is great gain. It's the combination of godliness and contentment. So let's unpack that. Let's talk about godliness first, right? What is godliness? Another translation of that is true religion. Godliness is a God-centered life. I know you're probably like, I was waiting for something really good, and that's all you got? No, godliness is a God-centered life. Now, here's the contrast. The contrast of a God-centered life and maybe your life or the life of a lot of people, my life, maybe the life of certain people, and maybe not every day, but at certain times during the week, during our day. The difference between a God-centered life and a me-centered life. A God-centered life is me saying, I'm waking up and I know the Great Commission, go and make disciples of all nations, uh, seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness and all these other things that you worry about. God's going to provide your needs. Don't worry about that. Seek first God's kingdom, right? That's a God-centered life. The me-centered life is, God, you are here to help me live my life. You are here to be my companion when I'm lonely. God, you exist for me. That's what's called a me-centered life. That's where you want just enough God to give you forgiveness for your sins, enough God to give you the peace that when I die uh, because of Christ and my faith in him, I'm going to go to heaven. But not, a, not enough of God in your life to transform you, to actually say, no, man, it's not about me. It's not I who live, it's Christ who lives in me, right? I've been crucified and now it's Christ. It's all about him. That's a God-centered life, right? Jesus Christ is the mystery of godliness. Back up a couple chapters and Paul's talking about this mystery of godliness. The same word, godliness with contentment is great gain. Same word, godliness, and he said, here's the mystery of godliness. And you know what Paul starts talking about? Jesus he said he came in the flesh, he, was, he appeared in a body, he was vindicated in the spirit, he was believed on among his people, and he was preached among the nations. You know, all talking about Jesus. And he said, here's the mystery of godliness. The, the mystery of godliness is Jesus. Look what Paul says in Colossians. It says, the hope of glory that you have, Christ in you. Christ in you, there's the hope of glory. A godly life is a Jesus-centered life. A godly life says, Jesus, you're the Lord, I'm the servant. You're the leader, I'm the follower. You know, if you want to get in real New Testament language, Jesus, you're the Lord and master, and I'm the slave. But I'm volunteering to be a slave. You're not holding me in chains. I'm holding myself under your authority. That's what a God-centered life is. Godliness is a God-centered life. So the, the whole idea is increasing Christ's presence in your life. There's where the hope of becoming the person that God calls you to be resides. So Paul, that's why Paul says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glorious life is going to be Christ in you and going to be practicing his presence, living his presence. And when you have that kind of godliness, you're going to be that step closer, that much closer to contentment. So Paul says this key phrase, godliness with contentment is great gain. You have to combine those two. Contentment is finding joy and satisfaction in what God has given you. Now this is going to, be, this is going to get interesting because here we go back to what, you know, back to my original question. What do you think it means to be happy or what, why would people be happy in this world? And then you say, well, there's, where, there's the secret of life is just to try to be happy. What does it truly mean to be content? Here's what I believe. I think it means that to be content means that whatever God has given you right now, right here in this moment, whatever God has given you, be satisfied with that, right? It doesn't mean it's always going to be that way. You may get a chance for promotion in the future. You may get a better job. You may get a, a different situation in the future. But for right here, right now, if this is where God has you, be content with that, right? There's a writer in Proverbs, and he says this. He says, oh, Lord, this is Proverbs chapter 30. This guy's a genius. Oh, Lord, give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. Otherwise, what would you do? Well, if I get too much... I would disown you, and I'd say, who's the Lord, right? Hey, what do I need God for? I got all this money, 
right? So you don't want to get too, too wealthy. You might forget about God. Or on the other side, I might become poor and I might steal and then I might dishonor the name of my God. So I don't want to get so poor that I think I have to steal just to get my daily bread. And I don't want to get so rich that I'm going to forget about God. So God, just put me somewhere in the middle, you know, make me happy the way I am. Give me neither poverty nor riches, right? Paul told the Philippians. Now, if you want to know the key word in the, in the letter to the Philippians, it's the word rejoice. Paul says this over and over. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice, right? And Paul was content. But notice how Paul puts it. Gets down to the last chapter, almost at the end of the letter, and Paul says this. And remember, he's been two years in Rome, under a Roman guard, in prison, chained to a Roman soldier, and he's writing these words. So I don't know what your circumstance is right now, but compare it to Paul. You know, here's the other thing. You want to get unhappy in life? Compare your life to somebody you think is doing better. You want to get happy in life? Be like Martin Luther when he passed the beggar on the road, the homeless beggar who is begging for a piece of bread, and he says, there, but for the grace of God, go I. So you can compare and get happy. <laughs> this is just who you're comparing yourself to. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or living in want. Paul said, I've learned the secret of being content. You think walking with Jesus 30 years and all the trials that Paul went through, all the setbacks, all the imprisonments and the beatings that Paul went through, and he says, I've learned the secret of being content. Paul still had to learn to be content. It did not come automatically. Being content, happy where God has placed you right now, happy with what God has given you right now, that is not a natural state of being. I think we humans are like, well, you know, I have this right now and that's fine, but what does everybody else have, you know? And we're always looking around and, and doing the comparison thing or watching TV and getting discontent because we see another advertisement telling us we need this, whatever that is, in order to be happy, right? So godliness with contentment is great gain. Paul had to learn the secret. He said, there were times when I had plenty, but God brought me to situations where I was also in need. And, though, and through that suffering, I learned something. I discovered the secret of being content. How interesting. It wasn't getting everything he wanted that made Paul content. Paul had to experience some loss in order to experience the good fruit of contentment. Now, I came across this Puritan preacher, and you probably never heard of him. I'd never heard of him until this week. His name is Jeremiah Burroughs, and he's preaching in England in the 1620s and 30s and 40s, right? He writes this letter called The Rare Jewel of Christian Contentment, and he says some things that I think are, are pretty genius, revolutionary. Uh, this is what this Puritan pastor says. He says, a Christian comes to contentment not so much by way of addition as by way of subtraction. So all the math science people in the room are like, hoo, ha, hoo. You know, what does that mean? Uh, not by addition, by way of subtraction. What does he mean? Contentment does not come by adding to what you have. If I just got this, I would be happy. Right? He's writing in the 1630s. They had a lot less in merry old England in the 1630s than what we have today. And he's still having to tell God's people this. So he says, we don't reach contentment by adding to what you have, but by subtracting from, and here's the key, subtracting from what you desire. The world says you'll find contentment when your possessions rise to meet the level of your desires, right? I gotta, if, here's my desires, here's what I have. If I can just get to the level of my desire, oh, now I'm going to be happy. But Jesus is different and his ways are higher and, and when your possessions rise to the level of your desires. But here's the Christian. The Christian has another way to contentment, and that is he can bring his desires down to his possessions. So according to Jeremiah Burroughs, and I agree with him wholeheartedly, one of the keys to being content, godliness with contentment is great gain. One of the keys to be content is drop the level of your desires to the level of whatever you have, of your possessions today, wherever you are today, right? 
That's advanced Christian faith right there. You don't learn that naturally. That doesn't come easily. Paul said he, said he had to learn the secret of being content. We got to adjust our desires to the level of our possessions. And again, how easy that is to say <laughs> and how challenging it is to do. That's why Paul had to say, I've learned the secret. It did not come naturally to him. Years later, now Paul's writing to Timothy and he says, godliness with contentment is great gain. Timothy, we brought nothing into this world and we can take nothing out of it. If we just have food and clothing, that will be enough. Now, I want to show you uh, an illustration because I was looking for this. This is the best I could find, black and white from the 60s, but somebody had the idea that I had. You ever heard the phrase, have you ever heard of a hearse pulling a U-Haul? <laughs> right? Have you ever heard, and I think the caption says something like, ain't never seen a tow bar on the, ba on the back of a hearse, right? Somebody in Texas probably wrote that. No, no offense to you, Texans. But you can always tell a Texan. You just can't tell them much. So, so um, I had a guy, he was our, my first pastor when I went into the youth ministry, and he was from Oklahoma. He was so pro-Oklahoma, like Sooner Boomer and all that, college football, so pro-Oklahoma, he called Texas Baja, Oklahoma. So I had a lot of respect for that guy. Anyway, uh, but, but just remember the illustration. For you brought nothing into this world, and you can take nothing out of this world. So even if you're able to accumulate a lot of possessions and a lot of stuff, number one, what good is it going to do you? I think that's one of, one of my first observations about, about overcoming and being free from discontentment. Slide 17, please. It says, realize, it says, realize you cannot keep what you gain, Right? You can't keep what you're getting. People long to be rich. It, and here's the thing. Getting rich, if that's your goal, you're, you're not going to be able to keep what you gain. You remember what uh, Solomon says in the book of Ecclesiastes? Remember he said, I, I tried everything in order to be happy. Everything in life under the sun, I tried it all. I tried wealth, riches, building projects, women, all, all, everything in life that he tried. And he said, nothing brings happiness. He just says, vanity, vanity, useless, meaningless, life here under the sun, life without God, it's meaningless. And he says, we brought nothing into the world, you can take nothing out of it. One of Solomon's observation was, so what if you do get really rich? Guess what happens? You're going to die, you can't take it with you, and you're going to give the money to some idiot son of yours, and he's going to squander it all and waste it all. So what good is that going to do? So anyway, that's Solomon's words, not mine. Uh, you might even get rich, but if you do get rich, you can't take your money with you. So uh, be free from discontentment by understanding that. And then secondly, once you start on this path to try to get more and more and more, it says those who want to get rich, verses 9 and 10, though people who want to get rich says they'll, they'll fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. The love of money is a root. It's not the only root of all evil, but it is one of them. The love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. So you, you go down this, this pathway of discontentment. What I have is not enough. I want more. In fact, I'm willing to do, and, and this is where Satan's ears just go like, like Shere Khan in the, in the Jungle Book, where, where he gets like, hey, what are you saying now? Uh, because now he can work in your life. Uh, I'm willing to do whatever it takes to get more, right? Because that's the goal in life. And he says, you do that, oh, you're going to fall into so many temptations and traps and into many foolish and harmful desires. Um, there's a great illustration, by the way. It was in the Word for you today. It was in yesterday's. Uh, August 31st on Saturday. And it talked about this businessman. And this business, businessman, he's down at the docks uh, by the sea and he's walking along and he sees this fisherman. It's in the, somewhere in the morning, late morning. And the businessman, you know, he's wealthy and he's strolling along there and he sees this fisherman and the fisherman is just like chilling. He's sitting there in his boat and he's got his feet up and he's having a cup of coffee and he's just loving life, right? And the fisherman and the businessman says to the fisherman, couldn't catch much today, and the, and the fisherman says, no, I caught plenty. I caught all I need for today. That's why I stopped. 
And the businessman says, well, you know, the day's not over yet. He says, why don't you go back out? Why don't you go back out for another catch or another catch? What, if you do, you could make more money and then you could buy another boat and then you could hire some men to do all this work. And, and the guy says, why would I want to do that? And he says, well, if you did that and you worked harder, you could get rich. And, and the guy and the fisherman says, why would I want to do that? And he says, so that you could, you know, get rich and then you could retire and sit back and relax. And the fisherman smiled and grinned and he says, well, that's what I'm doing right now. <laughs> so you can be content with what you have because if you're not going to be content, you will face a lot of temptations. If you set your heart on money, you will expose yourself to powerful temptations that will ruin many people. You may break the law, and for sure you're going to leave a trail of hurt or exploited people in your pathway. So understand you'll face temptations. How else to be free, can, free from discontentment? Number three, be careful not to wander away from the faith. Because there's another thing that happens. You know, Jesus says you can't serve two masters, right? You'll love one. You'll hate the other. You'll serve one master and you'll despise the other. And he says, you can't serve both God and money. You can't do both at the same time, right? Some people eager for money have wandered away from the faith. That's usually what happens. Certainly Jesus described it in the parable of the sower. In Matthew's gospel, in Mark's gospel, Jesus talks about the sower who goes out, this farmer goes out to scatter seed. And the seed is defined as the gospel message, right? So the farmer's out there and he's scattering the gospel message, the seed, and some of the seed falls on four different kinds of soil, right? One of the soils was this. It says, the seed is God's word and the thorns and thistles are this. The worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, the desire for other things, right? So what happens? It says the seed that fell on that particular soil was choked, you think about, I mean, I, I hate to do it to myself, but this idea, if somebody is really choking you, you can't hardly get a breath. You can't function normally, right? So what that, in, the, in, the, in the agricultural sense, seed that is being choked by thorns and thistles, it's never going to grow up and be healthy. That seed is never going to produce any good fruit. And he says, that's the road you want to go down? Then, then, Live a life where you, all you're consumed are, you're consumed by the worries of this life, you're consumed by wealth, and by the way, look how Jesus describes it. He says, you're consumed by the deceitfulness of wealth. Deceitfulness is this idea that Satan's lying to you that says, if you just had this money or if you just had these possessions, then you would be happy. We're right back to where we started. How do you get happy? Well, if I just had this stuff, I would be happy. Jesus calls it the deceitfulness of wealth. And lying is a two-way street. Lying never works. Lying never has any power over you unless you choose to believe the lie. If I had this, I would be happy. There's the lie, and if you believe it, now you can be deceived by it. And that's why Jesus calls it the deceitfulness of wealth, because you buy into the lie, and now you're on the road. And that road, where does that lead you? Toward greater godliness? No, it leads you to wander away from the truth. And eventually, you become apostate, like Paul talks about in chapter 4, and these false teachers teaching false doctrine. And, and Paul says, get away from that stuff. Timothy, godliness, a God-centered life with contentment brings great gain. Godliness with contentment brings great gain. Finally, number four, the last observation about how to be free from discontentment is you and I, we have to turn away from what will lead to great sorrow. Turn away from what will lead to great sorrow. So look at this. It says, some people eager for money have pierced themselves with many griefs. Bob, I don't think they're talking about people in the tattoo shop here, right? These are, th these are not people who voluntarily pierce themselves for some kind of jewelry to put on themselves. These are people that are going after money and wealth and the deceitfulness of riches. And on the pathway to get there, they're destroying relationships. They're losing their family. They're, they're losing what they, 
want, really wanted in life or what would have really made them happy in order to get this other thing that once they get that, that's not going to be enough because greed always works that way. Greed always says, well, if you get this, you'll be happy. And then the li there's the lie and then you believe the lie and then maybe you get that. And then greed says again, well, yeah, but now you need this. Now you need this, and now you need this. It's always a little more. It's never satisfied with what you have. So we go back to the Puritan preacher, Jeremiah Burroughs, and he says, you really want to be content? You want to learn that rare jewel of contentment? He says, take your desires and make your desires at the same level of your possessions. And if you can do that, then you can learn to be content and to be happy. Rick Warren is a pastor in the Saddleback Church. Rick Warren is this guy famous. Uh, it, it's always hard for pastors to talk about this because it's so hard to do what he's done. But anyway, when you sell 35 million copies of a book called The Purpose Driven Life, you get enough royalties to be able to do this. But Rick, you know, most pastors, they'll, they'll, they will talk about this idea of how do you handle your money and your finances in life. And they say the best way to do that is you do the 90-10 principle right? The 100% of whatever your income is, you keep 90 of it. Maybe you save some of it, but you keep 90 of it, and those are your living expenses. And the other 10%, which is called a tithe, tithe means 10%, that you tithe or you give 10% of your income to God and to God's purposes and God's ministries, things that make a difference for God in this world. So it's called the 90-10 principle. Well, Rick Warren started that, and then he got famous, and then he started selling all these books, and then he became pretty well-to-do. But the way that Rick Warren does not get caught up into materialism is Rick flipped the, flipped the script, right? Instead of keeping 90 and giving away 10%, Rick Warren says, I'm going to be a 1090 person. So he and his wife, Kay Warren, they keep 10% of their income, and they give away 90% of it. So when he says these words, I just want you to know, this isn't, a, this isn't a guy talking a bunch of hot air. This is a guy who's actually lived it out. He says, he says, bring your desires down to the level of your possessions. Practice the art of godly contentment, and you'll find its great gain. God tells us that selfishness causes all kinds of problems. For example, the Bible says that the greedy, the greedy set an ambush for themselves. They're trying to get themselves killed. <laughs> Such is the fate of all who are greedy for money. It robs them of life. Proverbs chapter 1. He says, you can be so busy making a living, trying to get more, trying to be rich, that you forget to make a life. So busy making a living, you forget to make a life. There's only one antidote to materialism, and that is generosity. There's only one antidote to materialism, and that is generosity. Every time you give, this is, this is Rick Warren's writing here. It says, every time you give, you break the grip of materialism in your life. Because giving is the opposite of materialism. Materialism is always like, gather it in for yourself. Hold on to it. Hoard what you can get. Keep what you can get. And remember, you can't take it with you, but at least you can gather it while you're alive. Materialism is all about what you get. To break its grip on us, we need to do the exact opposite. We need to give, give, and give. And when you do, your heart grows bigger and you grow spiritually. So bottom line, it says the greatest antidote to discontentment, which happens from greed and materialism, the greatest antidote is generosity. So let me land this plane. How can you experience freedom from discontentment? How can you and I experience freedom from discontentment? We're back to... If you don't remember godliness with contentment is great gain, maybe you can remember this. You have your desires. Maybe you guys can help me out here. Hold up your hand, this, and say, here's my desires. Most, most people, it's rarely the other case. Do you know anybody whose desires are here and what they have is here? <laughs> I don't know too many people like that. It's usually the other way around. Our desires are here, our possessions, our material, wealth, where we are financially, whatever. Here's our desires. Here's what we have. And he says, bring your desires. Instead of saying, I got to have more, more, more. If I can just get more, 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 now I'm happy. It says, bring your desires down to the level of your possessions. Learn to enjoy what God has given you more than grieving what you don't have. Right? Godliness with contentment is great gain.
John, can you and the worship team come on up? I want to pray together, and I'd ask you to bow your heads with me for a word of prayer. If that statement that Paul made is true, that a God-centered life combined with contentment, where our desires match, are balanced the same as the level of, of our possessions, that, that that is, that Lord, you call that great gain. So Lord, first of all, we pray that we would have a life that could be marked by godliness. God, help us to uh, move our lives closer to a life that resembles a Christ-centered life where we're seeking you first, where we're following you wholeheartedly, where you're not there just to help us if we get into trouble, but Lord, we're making you the center of our lives. Lord, we're taking ourselves off the throne of our life and we're putting you, Lord Jesus, square in the middle, in the center, on the throne of our lives. Lord, have your way in us, we pray. And then as we move toward godliness, we remember Jesus' words. He said, eternal life is this, that they may know you, the one true God, and Jesus Christ, whom he has sent. Jesus' words are true, then he's saying eternal life begins with a personal saving relationship with Christ. Do you have that in your life? Do you realize that Jesus is not just a teacher, a, a rabbi, a guru, a, a, a man who had a lot of good ideas, but that Jesus is so much more than that. He is God the Son, and he came to help you find your way back to God. That's what Jesus wants you to know today. He wants you to find your way back to God. He doesn't want to just be your creator. He wants to be your redeemer. He wants you to buy, he wants to buy you back and bring you into his family through his forgiveness because Jesus sacrificed himself on a terrible, ugly Roman cross and paid the price for your sins so that you and I could be reconciled to God. And he's saying, if you would just take your life, if you would turn around from whatever direction you're going and come back toward me, if you would humble yourself and ask me to forgive you, I would forgive you. And if you're ready to do that, whether you're here in this room today or you're watching online, if you're ready to embrace that new life that Jesus offers you, I invite you to pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I turn toward you today in faith. Please forgive me for all the wrong things I've done in my life. Lord, I am putting my trust in you. You died for me, and I'm declaring that I'm going to live for you from now on. Lord, thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for bringing me into your family. And I pray, God, that you'll show me the steps of what it means to follow you, of learning that secret to contentment where you say godliness with contentment is great gain. Show me how to do that. I pray and I thank you for your love. I thank you for eternal life. And I thank you for a fresh start. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer this morning, we've got some resources for you in the back where Lisa is in the back of the sanctuary on your way out. Please come see us. Come talk to us. We want to talk and rejoice with you. And now let's all stand together and sing.